Hello, and welcome to Travel Medicine. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood internal medicine doc, Dr. J. Hey, guys. This is Dr. Santosh, your pediatric infectious disease doc and researcher. And we are sometime out of spooky season, I guess. (laughs) Well, it can always be spooky season in your heart, you know? You know, I just... Yeah, or I don't know if you take your heart and put it into spooky season, or spooky season goes into your heart. I I never understood the logistics of how that worked. I mean, I guess I could continue infusing spookiness into oh. myself. Oh for my the god! Next month, Doctor Josh, is this one of your world famous awesome segues? This is my carefully scripted. Yeah. And yet still not even remotely applicable. Segway to the episode. Yay! <laughs> it's the beginning of a new month, and I figured we would start getting back to basics. So mm-hmm. today's episode, we're going to look at something else that I think you and I have kind of ceased to think about. It's it's a feature of hospitals that, much like some of our other basic episodes, is so ever-present that it doesn't even register with us anymore. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're in the developed world, obviously we're, you know, we're broadcasting live from the United States, but this is one of the elements of medical care that is so essential that it is on the most, it's on the most essential tier on the WHO medications or drugs. So this is one of these things that we think about, we don't think about, because if you're running anything, anything that's medicine, this should be available. I'll tell you, Josh, it, because we're going to talk about, I'm guessing, like septic shock and this kind of thing. Uh, you know, We talk about the antibiotics and fighting off the infection. But what we're going to talk about today, I would argue is as important, if not more important in that scenario for saving a life. So let's get into it. This week, we're going to be focused on Roman numeral four. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry. No, no, IV, what? IV. I, IV. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we've done a few of these episodes, right? Because you've taught us about how, you know, some of the first intravenous catheters were created, I think, like out of bamboo. Uh, but we're i think we're we're being a little bit more focused this episode right on on one yeah, aspect so i mean we'll we'll touch let's let's go dust off the way back machine it's getting a lot of use this oh, year oh yeah yeah we had to just for those of you who don't know or didn't know from just a little while back uh, ironically enough i um it might have been me i think i left the keys in it and we we had to do more than just dusting it off when we finally like dug it up out of that Anyway, I'm sorry. I won't let it happen and, again. And I think we'll begin with a, a classic nursery rhyme as we hop in the way back machine to set our destination. Oh, okay, yeah. In 1492, uh-huh. the Pope stroked out and needed to be transfused. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's not the usual one that we learn about, but yeah, that'll, that'll work. Okay. Is that... Is that not how the rhyme goes? Uh, no, no. I, I I, think it's Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1492. No, no, no. He's not in this story. Oh. <laughs> because you see in 1492, the yeah. very first documented attempt at any kind of intravenous therapy was performed by a doctor caring for Pope Innocent VIII in Rome. Wow. And the reason was after he had an apocalyptic stroke, not apocalyptic, apoplectic. Yeah. Ap- apoplectic, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, if in, in Britain, they might say apoplectic. So after having a stroke, the Pope fell into a coma, and the doctor, not knowing what else to do, gave him an infusion of blood from three young boys by joining them in anastomoses to exchange blood. So uh, kind of think <laughs> like human centipede, but with arms. yeah. To be very clear here, he he didn't take the blood out of those three boys and put it into a bag and then transfuse the bag. This was like vein to vein, right? Or vein to artery or something? Yes, it, it was a uh, young boy vein to, or young boy artery to Pope vein. Anyway, look, right. <laughs> long story short, yeah. it didn't work. 
all four died. Oh God! And, uh, <laughs> oh no! And the concept of IV transfusion is then absent from history for over a hundred years, oh. for no clear reasons. Well, okay. So this was this was one of these attempts that was so impactful, and this is a very human thing, right? We are more risk averse than we are, you know, reward hungry. So. This probably freaked everybody out enough to be like, don't even think about trying that. I mean, look, historically speaking, if the first attempt at a treatment kills the Pope, no. probably <laughs> you're not going to pursue that particular method Yeah, yeah. for at least quite <laughs> some time I, until you're in a more secular world. Yeah, and because it was, you know... Not just, oh, there was lack of scientific method and there was nobody to say, oh, maybe it wasn't, you know, that single attempt. Maybe we need to do this differently. But that thinking wasn't there. It was just that, oh, God probably doesn't want us to do this. <laughs> like that kind of thing you're talking about? Like God just sitting there like, all right, well, if that's how you want to do it, I'm taking my Pope and going home. <laughs> IV therapy began to be explored again with the science of how to transfuse blood. Um, now, we'll just very briefly touch on this. The very first recorded attempt at any kind of blood transfusion using IVs was in the 1660s. Uh, and again, unsuccessful, but Sir Christopher Wren created the very first successful IV infusion device from a pig's bladder and a writing quill. So you know that old Shakespearean, you know, what's the difference between a raven and a writing desk? Sure. Uh, well, if you combine the two of them, you can make an IV. Uh -huh. <laughs> quill makes a, a ton of sense. I, I like that because it's got a, you know, hollow center. It's going to be made of, I think, keratin or something that would be a, a fairly inert substance, right? So it wouldn't provoke a, you know, like a immune response or an allergic response. So in 1658, this bladder and quill uh, concoction was able to successfully infuse a mixture of wine, ale, opium, and antimony into a dog's veins. So this was oh, clearly some... Uh, but why? <laughs> why that combination? Pain, pain, control, pain control issue dog. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> but the primitive equipment actually proved to be a problem. We learned that quills were too flimsy and delicate, and they couldn't be fixed into blood vessels easily without breaking. Oh, okay. So next, silver was created as a IV, and the first successful transfusion between animals was done in 1665. Okay. And only two years later, in 1667, Dr. Jean-Baptiste Denis gave the first successful animal-to-human transfusion with oh. nine ounces of lamb's blood into a young man. And that's, I, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say that was probably a bad idea. <laughs> I'm guessing that didn't go over well. Well, that one actually went well. Oh, but a okay. lot of the following ones that people did produced the very first blood transfusion reactions. Sure. And then okay. the first snake oil artists with dubious transfusion practices. And look, the resulting deaths led French Parliament to ban all animal to human transfusions in 1668. So it had a good year in France and then was taken off the table again. But, but, yeah, no such ban in England. So there was an animal to human transfusion there with no reactions. Okay. And we got a few new devices. Uh, until it started coming up again with fear of adverse reactions. Sure. Okay. And uh, again, 1668, blood transfusions were prohibited by the English Parliament in 1668 and the Vatican in 1669. And okay. then again, another hundred years. Oh. Uh, the Vatican just keeps getting involved with, with transfusion <laughs> therapy, which, you know, they're probably still a little sore about the whole killing the Pope thing. There, There is... It's something that a lot of people don't fully understand because I, I think in, you know, our, our education isn't great in this day and age. We always think about the Vatican or the church against science because we always think of Galileo. But the truth of the matter is the church was one of the biggest arbiters and patrons actually of, you know, scientific type advancement. So they actually did 
look kind of overlook a lot of these types of processes. I wouldn't be surprised if, because the church is everywhere, right? It's all throughout Europe. I wouldn't be ter- terribly sur- surprised if they weren't the actual mode of communication by saying that, like, hey, it's been tried over here, it's been tried over here, it's not working. You know, please go ban it. You know, talking to England, talking to France, all that kind of thing. The royal academies, so to speak. So let's let's speed up a little. We'll fast forward to the 18th century. Okay. Um, just because I want to mention this particular gentleman for his delightfully appropriate name. <laughs> is it stick or is it poke or? Uh... Oh, that's not a bad one either. Okay. Uh, no. In 1796. Okay. Dr. Philip Singh Physic. Oh. Uh, P-H-Y. S I C K. Okay. Very nice. Yeah, physic is it's the concoctions that were used. It's where we get the term physician from. Yeah, so Dr. Philip Singh Physic, known as the father of modern surgery, became the very first to suggest human to human transfusions. Remember, animal to human transfusions had been banned twice by the church sure. and by the parliaments of at least two separate countries. Okay. <laughs> Like, like big time. No, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. But this guy's like, what if we put it from one human into another human? And the church is like, we already tried that with three young boys. And, sure. and the physic is like, no, no, but hear me out. Sure. <laughs> but what if we did though? <laughs> and then shortly after this was proposed, Dr. James Blundell did not blunder it. A British obstetrician Uh performed a series of human blood transfusions for postpartum hemorrhage between 1825 to 1830. He did 10 transfusions over this time, five of which were beneficial. Uh, Okay. Five of which were beneficial. Oh, oh, uh, you know what? 50% 50% in terms of, because I'm guessing these were all like life-saving or attempt to save a life type of a thing, right? So given that probably all of them would have died, all of these folks, 50% mortality or or success rate is pretty damn good. Yeah. So now we kind of reach an area where we can start digging a bit more into history. So now you know that was the beginning of just infusion therapy in general and focused on blood. And right. that's a topic that we've covered in the past and we can maybe revisit another time. But I want to now jump just slightly ahead in time uh, towards the end of Dr. Blundell's five successful blood transfusions okay. and talk about what was going on in the world in Europe around that time. Okay. Hold on and just it, two it, seconds. Uh, clutch and let it out slowly. No, oh, okay. Okay. okay, sorry. A little rough on the clutch there, Santos. So- but you got us uh, Scotland, eighteen thirty-two. It's like future technology. Why the hell does it have a clutch? This is you and your steampunk nonsense, isn't it? I may have gotten a few design tips from H.G. Wells. <laughs> All right. All right. Where are we? So we are in (laughs) Scotland in 1832, or at least we're traveling to Scotland on ships from India, and we're bringing along with us cholera. Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. The second worldwide pandemic uh, of cholera. And this is about 20 years before our favorite know-nothing Jon Snow proved that contaminated water was the cause. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, the disease was spreading pretty rapidly and, uh, there were riots and people kind of mistrusted the medical profession. What with Burke and Hare stealing corpses out of graveyards. Yeah. To yeah. Get <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To, to sell for, uh, profit actually. And I think, uh, I believe not just stealing the corpses, but sometimes making the corpses, so to speak. <laughs> Well, yeah, they they yeah. wanted to cut out the middleman and just start creating corpses. <laughs> oh, I literally, they own. literally cut out the middleman. <laughs> yeah. um, so Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy realized that large amounts of water and saline or salt were lost from the blood of cholera victims. Okay. And he did this by looking at kind of what they were urinating out. Sure. Oh, very smart. Okay. Gotcha. 
Um, he used he used a little bit of funky math. Uh, what, what not girl math, not dog math, not boy math, yeah. but eighteen uh, hundreds physician math. Sure, <laughs> which is tough. We're still trying to get around to the point where medicine is becoming a science, like actually using quantitative measures and this kind of a thing. Um, anything else in terms of medical science at this point comes from either basic science, biology, or chemistry. So yeah, it's going to be rough. <laughs> now, early physicians, even as far back as you know our, our 1600s Pope treating ones, knew that human blood was salty. Are you going to tell us how without grossing us out or... Is it? I like, am not. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> just, you just you look. Listen. You ever bitten your tongue? It's oh, like a salty metallic taste. Like this didn't take. Yeah, uh, it's a lot uh, of <laughs> a lot of highly effective clinical trials. Sure. You know, okay. See blood, <laughs> blood, taste blood, mm, salt. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fair. Okay. 1831. We have a devastating strain of cholera that started along the Ganges River. Yeah. spread mm-hmm. rapidly overland into China, Iran, and Russia before it came on the trade routes into Europe. Yep. Uh, cargo ships from the British Isles were turning from India and the Baltic, brought it along with them. And young Irish physician William Brooke O'Shaughnessy was safely in Edinburgh, far from the epicenter of cholera. He was 22 years old and confident that chemistry would lead to the application of the cure. So he traveled all the way to the center of where the outbreak was to immerse himself in what was going on. Hopefully not, you know, physically immerse yourself. For anyone who's thinking about why the hell did it go like this? Basically, if you didn't have good germ theory and bad hygiene or anything like this, the person with cholera is going to poop out all of the bacteria around them. And all that needs is just a few of those bacteria to, you know, get on someone's hand and then in the mouth. If there's a shared water source that gets contaminated that way, you are in trouble very quickly. So that means a closed system, Josh, like a a ship, right? Where the only water source is the shared water barrels and stuff. You can get these spreading damn quickly, which is why I will never go on a cruise. Oh, we have thoughts about uh, cruise. Yeah. <laughs> but so as we said, key to his work was the notice that water, sodium, chloride, and bicarbonate had been leached from the blood, lost in the stool. And he published these findings in The Lancet, um, which here is straight from his, his study. The indications of cure are two in number, vis-a-vis First, to restore the blood to its natural, specific gravity. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. That's nice. All right. Second, to restore its deficient saline. The first of these can only be affected by absorption, imbibition, imbibition, okay. like imbibing, imbibing or, by the, okay. or by the injection of aqueous fluid into the veins. Oh, okay. So now he's thinking, he's thinking, he's like, I can either... You know, get it in the into them with their mouth and they can absorb it. But if they can't do that, maybe I can just replace it straight in. We were interested in O'Shaughnessy because he kind of deduced that it needed to be replaced. But the real hero or protagonist of this particular story or episode is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Thomas Lotta. And we like him a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should. What did he do? Because less than two months after the Lancet publication, he was he took up the idea of replacing fluid directly, mostly because uh, a lot of physicians had attempted rectal delivery of salt solution for resuscitation. Oh, like an enema type of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're like, okay, well, people are losing a lot of water out of their rectum. Okay. from cholera. Sure. What if we just, you know, uh, made them butt chug it back in? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Well, and the, the colonic mucosa, so the, the, you know, the, the, the lining of the colon is actually kind of tailor made for liquid transport from the intestinal lumen into the bloodstream. So it's not a bad idea. His solution was to then, instead of injecting it or giving enemas, to replace it directly through the veins. Okay. All right. So let's give this a try. Sure. 
So let's let's read a little bit about the letter he sent first, and then I will tell you uh, what he what his results were. And there's just some delightful old timey language, so I, I have to go into the article proper. Oh yeah, absolutely. old timey medical speak is the best medical speak in my opinion. <laughs> so before entering into the particulars. I beg leave to premise that the plan which I have put in practice was suggested to me on reading in The Lancet the review of Dr. O'Shaughnessy's report on the chemical pathology of malignant cholera, by which it appears that in that there is a disease with a great deficiency of water and saline matter, on which deficiency the thick black cold state of vital fluid depends, which produces most of the distressing symptoms of that very fearful complaint and is doubtless often the cause of death. Finding thus that such in common with all the ordinary means in use was useless or hurtful, I at length resolved to throw the fluid immediately and directly into the circulation. In this having no precedent to direct me, I proceeded with much caution. The first subject of my experiment was an aged female on whom all the usual remedies had been fully tried. That would have been leeches and enemas oh dear. Without, <laughs> producing, without producing one good symptom, the disease uninterrupted holding steadily on its course. She had apparently reached the last moments of her earthly existence and now nothing could injure her. Indeed, so entirely was she reduced that I feared I should be unable to get my apparatus ready ere she expired. Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> who's got time to type those kind of notes on Epic? Yeah, exactly. And this was this was handwritten. I absolutely love it. So he's saying, I've read this stuff. Uh, I'm I'm really grateful for Dr. O'Shaughnessy. Here's his credit. And this is what he talked about in terms of the missing components. This is what I was able to put together. And here was a person, we tried to save them from cholera. I have no other recourse. So I'm going to start trying experimental stuff, but I'm going to base it on some really, really good observations. And that that last bit in there for those who don't know, or maybe even younger people is like, I, I, I know what to do. I know what to put together and I have to shove this into her veins, but I have to make it and I don't know if by the time I finish making it, she's going to be alive or dead, but let's give it a go. What he did is he had his own uh, kind of solution that he had created, and he injected it directly into the basilic vein. Santosh, how good's your anatomy? You remember where the basilic vein is? <laughs> I only know this because this is one of the ones that we use quite often when placing like a pick line, Josh, so a peripherally inserted central catheter. So. It, it usually goes into the arm. So the basilic vein is one of the confluences that starts in about, I'd say like the, the mid upper arm, like around where your bicep is. Yeah. So it is, it's one of the ones that traditionally, if you've ever had your blood drawn, that's probably one of the ones they're taking. It's very, very easy to find. Yeah. It, it shows up kind of in a shallow spot um, by your, the crook of your elbow, which is where people usually aim to draw blood. And it runs from the, if you're holding your arm with your thumb facing toward the outside, yeah. it traces from the outer part of your arm, working its way all the way down towards your pinky. So it yeah. starts on the thumb side, up near the shoulder, then crosses over around the forearm and terminates right around your pinky. Yeah, so it it crosses, it goes diagonal like that. Yeah. Now, uh, going back to Doctor Lada's letter, he provided a lot of detail. Ounce after ounce was injected, but no visible change was produced. Oh, Still wow. persevering, okay. I thought she began to breathe less laboriously. Okay. When soon the sharpened features and sunken eye and fallen jaw, pale and cold began to glow with returning animation. The pulse, which had long ceased, returned to the wrist. At first, oh. small and quick, by degrees, it became more and more distinct. And in the short space of half an hour, when six pints had been injected, her extremities were warm and every feature bore the aspect of comfort and health. 
Yay! Oh, that's so good. Oh my god, I love every bit of that. <laughs> the patient then died after her diarrhea recurred. Ah, oh, fudge. Oh well. At first, but but Doctor Lada <laughs> persevered. Okay. Well, because there was there was a positive result at least for a, a time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So. At first, there is but little felt by the patient, and symptoms continue unaltered. But the improvement in pulse and countenance is almost simultaneous, and the livid hue disappears with the warmth of the body returns. The second patient he described giving this treatment to survived after receiving 330 ounces. Now, for those of you playing Dr. Math at home, that's over nine liters so nine Whoa. Coke okay so he replaced basically this entire person's blood <laughs> that's that's no. about the blood volume actually it might be a little bit more than the blood volume of an, an average size size human being now this was given 9 liters over 12 hours instead of 6 pints over 30 minutes um and in 48 gotcha, hours gotcha. of receiving the treatment the patient smoked her pipe free from any distemper. Now, <laughs> this was revolutionary. No one had managed to really treat cholera successfully. You either survived it or you didn't. And of course, this was then predictably controversial as most, you know, momentary Johnny on the spot treatments in medicine tend to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Lancet and the London Medical Gazette in 1830 were filled with reports, people both enthusiastic, skeptical. Um, but after this malignant cholera epidemic subsided, the treatment wasn't really used again. And we kind of didn't see it made use of for about another 50 years yeah. until the early 1880s. Uh, when it was done to resuscitate patients with hemorrhage. Okay. All right. So it's, it's coming along now. We've we've got a few. Uh, we're we're stepping towards what would become modern practice. It sounds like. Yeah, we are. We're we're getting there. Okay. Um, now we got you know better needles and syringes in the late eighteen forties and fifties. Uh, the introduction of anesthesia. So everything was starting to kind of make use or, or speed up. So now let's talk briefly about the evolution of supportive fluids. Although I, I will throw in just one or two other facts before we get into the creation of IV fluids. In the early 1900s, after we had sort of worked out a lot of the kinks of making this saline solution, IV infusions were housed in just open containers, which were covered with gauze to prevent contamination. Just think like an upside down milk jug. Yeah. That like, had been <laughs> like a tub. It, it, it would have been difficult because you still have to, the in order to get it to flow, we didn't use a pumping system, right? So you have to use gravity. So you have to, and I'm, I'm guessing glass in this case. You'd still have to, you know, get it up above a person's, you know, height. So it, it was glass because plastic didn't exist yet. <laughs> yeah, definitely not in the scales we use currently. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, by the 1930s, we had vacuum sealed glass bottles. And then around the 50s or 60s, we switched over to the plastic bag. But interestingly, did you know, until the 1940s, only doctors were allowed to give IVs. Nurses couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. I I would imagine for a good long time, just like now, it would be a specialized procedure. You'd have to study in order to know the proper way to administer it. And then, of course, monitor the response and all that kind of a thing. Whereas as it became a less specialized skill, uh, and nurses, frankly, became better and better at kind of day-to-day, hour-to-hour care, of especially inpatients, then it would have transferred over. This is not the first time this kind of thing has happened, but it well, makes a ton of sense. This is past 
this is long past uh, our time, Santosh, but some of our attending physicians who taught us may still remember into the 1950s, a lot of physicians were still using surgically implanted metal needles to give IVs, which were sharpened by hand Whoa. sterilized and reused. So it oh. said, you know, the article I found says many physicians will still remember holding these needles up to the light to detect barbs and filing them down by hand. What? Okay. So you had to be uh you had to be a machinist. You had to be an engineer. Yeah. Okay. And in late 1950, we got the Rochester plastic needle created by Dr. David Massa of the Mayo Clinic. Okay. And that was basically a PVC tube over a needle. And that's the, uh, that's basically what you see today. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if a lot of you folks who are listening know this, but you, you still have what's called the stylet or the, the metal needle that when you place an IV catheter, so we no longer call them IV needles, it's IV catheter. So you still have the steel part in the, in the center. You push that through and that, that pokey part is the one that allows you to get into the blood vessel. But then that's actually withdrawn. And the rubber flexible tip is the one that stays, I think it's about maybe uh, two centimeters, Josh, uh, inside of the vein. That's the part that dwells in there. And then that way you don't have to have a piece of metal sticking. The the plastic can flex along with the vein and move around in case, you know, the positioning and that kind of a thing. We do still have the full metal IV catheters, but generally speaking, those are used just to draw blood and take out as soon as you've collected what you've collected. So now that we've got to just kind of the fun needle part of the IV, oh, yeah. let's talk about our IV fluids and how we select them. So yeah. In the 1880s, a physiologist named Sidney Ringer created a solution containing sodium, potassium, and chloride in concentrations pretty similar to blood. We call this, as some of you in the medical profession may know, lactated ringers, okay. although it wasn't <laughs> lactated until the 1930s. Okay. Oh, when, so it, when, was, uh, it was Ringer Alexis solution. Hartman yeah, it was Ringer solution. And then in the 1930s, Alexis Hartman added lactate to prevent acidosis in pediatric patients. So oh, it's a buffer distress. for acid mm -hmm. and prevents changes in pH. Okay. With the development of blood fractionation in 1941, the very first time albumin was used to resuscitate patients who were burns during the attack on Pearl Harbor. So the very first use of human albumin in IV infusion was the same year of Pearl Harbor. Oh, okay. So that, that came at a fortuitous time, I suppose. Yeah. So we've got Ringer's solution that was created for children with gastroenteritis. Yeah. Was then later modified for the diabetic children with lactate to buffer the acid. Sure. Um, and then we have what every internal medicine doc and resident for all time tends to use, which is normal saline. Oh, that's the one. <laughs> so John, what, what makes it so normal as in like, it's not abnormal saline. Oh, I'm so glad you asked <laughs> because, because Santos this is one of my favorite facts. Okay. Tell me, tell me. It's a typo. Come on. No, wait, it gets better. <laughs> this is, we're, we're talking, we're going on, you know, close to what, 70 years of this. Oh, no. gosh. <laughs> Listening no. residents, fellow medical folks, <laughs> buckle in. Okay. Home listeners without any medical experience, we're about to have some fun. Well, no, no, sorry, I was wrong because we're we're in the 1880s, right? So, okay, 1980 would have been a hundred years, and then for this is like a hundred and forty year old mistake. We still haven't corrected it. Eh, too much effort. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. so the origin of normal saline has been traced to an 1883 study by a Dutch scientist named Hamburger. <laughs> so around the same time that Ringer's solution was developed, uh -huh. 
right? Yeah. So Hamburger's work suggested mistakenly. <laughs> Do- Dr. Hamburger's work. Dr. Hamburger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> his work suggested mistakenly that the concentration of salt in human blood was 0.9%. Oh, okay. Got gotcha. you. And percent in this case, when you're dissolving a solid in, into a liquid, um, 1% is one gram dissolved in a hundred milliliters of your solvent. So this would be 0.9 grams per hundred mils. And it comes from the studies of red cell lysis. Oh, uh, so okay. Now, uh, the actual concentration of salt in human blood is 0.6%. Oh, oh, Josh, we're overdoing it. We flipped it. Yeah, <laughs> we banged down, flipped it, and reversed it. Oh, that, that typo. Oh, okay. So not. I thought you were gonna say like the word "normal saline" was wrong, but no, no. We've we. So it's a typo in terms of the number. Oh no. Oh, this is this is like an important typo. <laughs> All typos are important, Santo. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot who I was talking to. But okay, got you. So it turns out normal saline is not very normal at all. Sure. The average sodium level in a healthy patient is about 140. And, and we call that milli equivalents per liter. Uh, right. um, for chloride, it's about 100. But the concentration of sodium and chloride in normal saline is 154. That's something we call hypertonic. Right. That's bad. Yeah, meaning that you have uh, the 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 salinity, the concentration of sodium chloride is much more so than that of in your blood. So it's high. The tonicity is more hypertonic as compared to your blood. Oh, okay. Which is we've recognized this, by the way. We know that you know you have to be a bit careful about giving too much normal saline because you know it can cause this problem. So here's the first of several times I'm going to say it. If you're, if you're giving resuscitated fluids, yeah. barring a couple exceptions, which we'll talk about, mm-hmm. the better choice is going to be lactated ringers, or if you are insistent on giving saline, half normal saline, the 0.45, yes. which is closer to human physiology at 0.6 right. than it is to 0.9. And- uh, in in children, depending on the age, we use again, m- you know, even more dilute concentrations because their uh, concentrations of primarily sodium chloride. What what we're thinking about, it's actually quite different even from that. So an infant will get a different concentration than a child uh, than will a, an adult. You're right. So you might be asking, and and you did earlier. Okay. If this was based on a typo, wouldn't we have figured it out in the hundred and forty years since? Yeah. Well, it turns out that in the nineteen nineties, uh, scientists showed that the high level of chloride in normal saline could make the blood acidic, which you know yeah. can disrupt a whole bunch of biochemical processes. So they're like, all right, well, you know, it can make blood acidic. That's probably not good. And yeah. they kind of put that out to the medical field and they're like, yeah, but normal saline is just so easy to order. It so, is. And, and so actually let's get in- easier to manufacture as well, which is why I believe it's quite cheaper uh, here in the United States. So then we get to 2012 with sort of the first study looking at this. And yeah. researchers examined a database of patients who got either saline or or a balanced solution like lactated ringers during surgery, and they compared complications and mortality between the groups. And mortality was 2.7% higher in those that received normal saline. Gotcha. Um, Okay. Then Australian physicians showed that ICU patients who are most likely to need fluid resuscitation, given chloride-rich fluids like normal saline had nearly double the rate of kidney injuries compared with those given balanced fluids. Still not enough for you? In 2013, another study showed increased mortality and longer hospital stays 
among all surgical patients who got normal saline. And in 2014, researchers at Duke found that septic patients had a 3% increase in mortality when treated with saline. Right. This is time number two. Use lactated ringers or half normal saline for your patients. Yes. What what are the other but not full on 0.9% saline? So researchers across all of these studies measured combined outcomes of death, need for dialysis, or persistent kidney problems. Okay. And about 14% of patients who got balanced fluids like lactated ringers had these kinds of outcomes, death, dialysis, or kidney problems, okay. compared to 15% of patients who got normal saline. Okay. 1% doesn't sound like a big percentage yeah. point difference. Sure, sure. But given two solutions that are equally available, equal in cost- o- Outside of mil- the United States. <laughs> and millions of adults receive every year, 1% is pretty good. Like, Improving mortality by 1% with an expensive drug would be insane, much less a fluid that costs $2. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty huge. And, um, you know, we say relative risk versus, uh, you know, the, the overall risk. You're, you're talking about a mortality difference of 1%, you know, 14 versus 15%. But actually, the relative risk reduction in mortality is more like, uh, I'd say close to like 15%, because it's actually, you know, the one fifteenth, right, is is going away there. That's that's actually what's changing to go from fifteen percent down to fourteen percent mortality. I believe you were talking about the cost, Santosh. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure here in the United States, unfortunately, uh, for one reason or another, uh, and I was fooled into it when I was younger, I thought, oh, it's a manufacturing thing. But I think for some dumb reason, lactated ringers is much more expensive than half normal saline. Um, well, Uh, actually, oh, okay. A bag of lactated ringer solution costs Mm -hmm. around $4 and 50 cents per liter. Okay. All right. For 450. Okay. A bag of normal saline, a 1000 milliliter bag Uh is available online for $10. Oh, oh, much, okay, but half of that. A, a bag of half normal saline, mm-hmm. one liter, is available for $3. Oh, okay, so cheaper, but okay. And an IV bag hospital standard usually goes for about thirty three ninety nine. That's the exact same $10 bag, but you're getting it in the hospital instead of on Amazon. Right. <laughs> okay. So lactated ringers remains the cheaper fluid. I know I'm okay. sitting here being a giant traitor to all my internal medicine colleagues, siding with the surgeons on what fluid to give, but <laughs> the data is there. No, no, it is. And and we've had this discussion actually in our, you know, quality improvement committees and this kind of a thing. Should the default rehydration solution be ringers lactate rather than, you know, quarter normal saline or half normal saline, or sorry, rather than half normal saline. Now for, for us, for our younger kids, when I am giving quarter normal saline, then it's unfortunately, it's a different argument because in that case, um, you know, we, we don't have an equivalent on the, the ringers uh, side. So, and Here's the thing. When you're selecting what kind of fluid and replace, the first step in any of these is you want to get somebody to what we call euvolemic. Yes. So if you have a disease like cholera or massive volume loss from uh, sepsis or trauma or shock, you need to get them back up to what, you know, you need the tank to be full first before you worry about preventing further losses. So that's when you do a bolus administration. Right. So euvolemia is not like a u volume. <laughs> so this is spelled e u volemic. So meaning that you want the, the u is the the prefix for the same. So you want the the 
blood volume to be the same as a normal person. Bolus, Josh, is uh, that's the thing that you swing around your head, right? Like the strings with the two weights on it, and then you chuck it at someone's legs and it wraps around and trips them. A bolus. I mean, you can do that yeah. with an IV bag, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making a stupid homophone joke with with bolos rather than bolus. Um, <laughs> but once you've achieved true volume status, which you do by kind of giving these rapid infusions of lactated ringers or more likely normal saline, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, then okay. the next step is to do maintenance fluids. So now you want to keep up with what the body is losing through sensible losses and insensible. Now, sensible losses are like, well done. You did a good job losing this specific fluid. It's fluid you can control losses from, like urine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Insensible losses are ones you have no way of controlling, like sweat or... Evaporation uh, Evaporation from uh, uh, your breath, actually. That can do it. Right. Um, so what you do is you do maintenance fluids. Now, Santos, you can probably talk briefly about the four to one rule in internal medicine. We use the 152 rule. Oh yeah. Yeah. So this has to do with, uh, how you give fluid resuscitation to a child actually, because we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, by weight, how much volume to give back. So what we do is we're talking about how much volume to give in that bolus, right? In that, you know, that flow in a person who's not, you know, 70 kilograms, five foot eight, you know, the, the absolute, you know, the, the, the typical kind of average person. So what we do is we say, you incorporate the first 10 kil- you calculate the first 10 kilograms of weight and you say that child will be getting 4 milliliters per kilo per hour uh, and up to 40 kilograms of course and then for the next 10 kilograms they'll be getting 2 milliliters per kilo per hour up to 20 more and then if they are more than 20 kilograms you will add on then 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour afterwards and generally speaking you know when you get to that you know 40 kilos type of average human size for most of the world not for the united states sadly <laughs> you're you're getting to the appropriate replacement volume that you want in order to get the person the hydration that they need not overdo it not underdo it right so for like say a, a 22 22- kilogram child Mm -hmm. the four to one would be so like a total of 62 milliliters an hour uh so you said 22 yeah 22 exactly yeah exactly right so four mils per kilo per hour for the first 10 40 two mils uh for the next 10 so that's 60 in total and then two more so yeah 62 milliliters per kilo uh, milliliters per hour right so it's not like you say okay we're going to give you 40 milliliters oh it's been an hour let's change you yeah. calculate the weight and then say, all right, we add up all these numbers based on weight, mm-hmm. and this is the rate of infusion to maintain anticipated losses. Um, right. Now, now Santa, I don't... were you aware that there were exactly zero clinical trials to come up with this rule? Yeah, this this was kind of a, a not back of the envelope, but a very well-educated mathematical calculation in terms of the percentage of body weight that would be blood or or intravascular fluid and then you know uh, the the weight of the kid and i believe at that time we found that weight was a better correlate than any other it metric it was they just took the adult rule and adjusted for surface area oh there we go yeah <laughs> That's that's it. Yeah. They're like, well, babies are tiny people, so let's look at the adult rule and just figure out what the surface area of a child is and adapt it yeah. based on that. <laughs> and um, mind you, it's not perfect, and there are other rules that we use for teeny tiny babies like our our infants that are you know 1.5 kilograms for instance you know these these little little things and we still have to make judge uh, adjustments based on the child's 
uh, kidney function, et cetera. Of course, when you've got patients who are very thin or very large, some of these idealized weight guidelines don't apply anymore because you're going to have people who have more or less surface area than the standard human. Yes, exactly. And the unfortunately, Josh, the uh, obesity epidemic, <laughs> amongst other things, is horribly shifting the metrics that we should be using. It's differences in uh, body surface area after you exceed a certain weight as per the height of a child. So for instance, yeah, if you have a little, like a three-year-old that's, you know, only a, you know, a foot, a couple of feet tall or, you know, less than a foot, you know, a couple of feet tall, but they're, you know, just round, there's globular, then <laughs> the body surface area metric is going to be much different. <laughs> And so this um, this won't hold as well. And unfortunately, yeah, I do have to worry about obese three-year-olds now. So a, a couple of final pearls as we infuse the last of this drip of knowledge. And you'll often hear the terms, at least in, in medical school, for resuscitation using colloid or crystalloid fluids. Do you know the difference? Yeah. So crystalloid fluid is going to be like your normal saline, your lactated ringers. It's going to contain, you know, a fluid with some ions in it, you know, sodium chloride, this kind of a thing. The colloid, I believe the big difference is you're going to have some protein or tissue, I believe, right? So the, the colloid that I usually think of that we give for fluid replacement would be albumin. Right. And Crystalloid fluids are about 99 and three quarters percent of the time better to use. Uh, one, albumin is more expensive, even though it has been determined to be safe in most critically ill patients. What we've seen is the use is associated with increased mortality in ICU settings, as well as specifically in patients with traumatic brain injuries. Um, so crystalloids like normal saline and lactated ringers are inexpensive, uh, but it also gives you a lot of edema because that colloids have protein that'll keep the fluid in the blood vessels. Yeah. Crystalloids will kind of redistribute. So if you're focused on just pumping as much fluid into somebody to rehydrate them, that fluid will leak out or sneak out of the vessels if it doesn't have pro enough protein to keep it in. And that can lead to things like swelling in the legs, buildup of fluid in the lungs, um, right. or even in the interstitial spaces that could cause problems later. Yeah, this is, this is what you see most commonly when you're aggressively trying to rehydrate a person who's in septic shock. So you do have, you know, all the fluid losses that we worry about, intestinal and urinary and all that. But you also have the loss of intravascular fluid because the inflammatory cytokines that are going around your body have made your capillaries uh, kind of dysfunctional and they leak. So the fluid that's supposed to stay in the blood vessels leaks out. And it, it's one of these unfortunate things. The crystalloid is still way better. You would think that you could add back that osmotic pressure by giving the, the albumin and things. But the truth of the matter is, Josh, it doesn't nudge the mortality too, too much. So albumin is really reserved for it should be reserved for those folks who are in shock or who are dehydrated and who are also, you know, protein deficient. You know, they're lacking albumin for other reasons. Now, as we, there's one other person I should mention as we're talking about IV infusions. And this starts in the 1960s when IV infusions finally were kind of a more ubiquitous site across all hospitals. It only took us what, you know, several hundred years to accept IVs. Mm -hmm. And then a doctor known as John Myers started injecting patients with a cocktail of vitamins and minerals. Oh, okay. Now his exact formula was lost on his death in the 1980s. It was a secret recipe like the Colonel's 11 herbs and spices. Oh God, he never wrote it down anywhere, huh? But uh, a lot of his patients came to an author, Alan Gabby, and 
uh, between the author and several experts, they came up with a modified version that's pretty close that includes vitamins B and C, Mm -hmm. magnesium sulfate, calcium gluconate, and selenium. Okay. Now, does any of that sound vaguely familiar to you? Because it's used in two different settings. Calcium, tell me that again, calcium gluconate. Magnesium sulfate, vitamin (laughs) B, vitamin C, and selenium. Uh, The magnesium sulfate, I believe, is just straight up Miralax. Um, what if I tell you that the color yeah. of this cocktail oh, oh, is makes it, is the it, IV yellow? Makes the IV yellow. Oh, 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 is this the banana bag? This is what's the, called in the hospital affectionately the banana bag. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is this is a micronutrient infusion. Yeah, you you give this. The, the uh, I mean, it is important to give in in cases of true like you know medical care, but I think it it kind of gained fame as a hangover cure. <laughs> For like, I think it's it's available uh, you know in outpatient clinics in Las Vegas as a hangover cure. <laughs> so sit down as, as I tap as I tap the podcast seat next to me. Okay, well, th- th- yeah. <laughs> He made the banana bag? He made the banana bag. It's also called Myers Solution. Okay, well, excuse Dr. Myers, okay. So we should probably give it its proper name rather than the goofy ass, yeah. In a hospital setting, the banana bag is used predominantly to treat people withdrawing from alcohol. Yes. Because a lot of these folks have had such chronic long-term use of alcohol that they are depleted in those specific electrolytes and that can cause neurological problems such as difficulty with balance, speech, coordination, and memory. It's frequent use to treat withdrawing alcoholics probably is associated with its believed ability to cure hangovers. Which is, uh, unfortunately, I, I think the proof is not quite there. Which I'm... is inaccurate because, okay. and listen closely, uh-huh. <laughs> rehydrating with IV fluids alone won't cure a hangover because dehydration is only one component. No matter how many electrolytes or vitamins or natural organic materials you want to say you're adding to the bag. So dehydration is not the basis for a hangover. It's the toxic metabolites of alcohol that are responsible, and they are not going to be excreted in the urine more rapidly than with intravenous fluid. Right. They are filtered very effectively by the kidney as long as you're not so ill that your blood pressure is low. And IV fluids do not make your liver work any faster, which is how your body breaks down the alcohol in your system. Get- <laughs> Hangover treatments are not covered by health insurance since they aren't medically necessary or provided in a medical setting. So you're paying anywhere from $100 to $400 for what is essentially a bag of colored fluid. <laughs> you would be much better served by drinking a sports drink directly because taking fluid orally is always preferable to inserting it into your veins, your rectum, or however else you think other than your mouth, you would like to take it. There you go. Yeah. The, what it does work for is, you know, vitamin, electrolyte, etc. replacement when you're worried about a person going into delirium tremens or, the neurological consequences of withdrawal. So that that's important. But if you're just trying to get over your headache and the horrible feeling of getting absolutely slammed last night, this isn't going to make things go faster. Get you some food, uh, drink you know, proper electrolytes and water, and you'll save yourself a ton of money and then get some rest. Um, Yes, please do not use alcohol to try to ward off the hangover. Please, please, please. As a there separate is comment. no, <laughs> there is no reason ever 
for you to go into a pop-up IV fluid clinic. Everything they are claiming they can cure, yeah. you can take care of by just drinking fluid the normal way. <laughs> if for yeah. some reason you are in need of IV fluids, a pop-up clinic should not be your first stop. <laughs> it's likely that you need a hospital or at least an urgent care. Yeah. If you take nothing away from this other than normal saline's based on a typo mm -hmm. and don't use IV pop-up clinics, I will be a happy camper. <laughs> yes, please, please don't encourage these fools. This is the height of scam. It's, it's awful. And remember, folks, I had to cross internal medicine picket lines to stand with surgery on the lactated ringer side. So I'm telling you this <laughs> at great risk to my own personal <laughs> reputation and street cred as a hospitalist. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's it for this week. Hopefully you learned something new about all those fluids. Uh, I'd like to bag it up. No diggity. No <laughs> doubt. <laughs> oh, is that where that lyric came from? Yes. I, I'd like to think so. Way to go, Blackstreet. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like the way they work it. Yeah, absolutely. So that's it for this week. As always, we love to hear your comments, questions, and feedback. If you'd like to support us spiritually, emotionally, or financially, links to do that are in the show notes along with links for further reading and links to sign up for our mailing list where you can find out about upcoming live appearances. And uh, there may be one of those coming up soon. Our theme music is composed by Rachel Leisure. This show is produced by me with a lot of help from Dr. Santosh and Friends. And uh, until next time, as always, keep a song in your heart, a shot on your arm, soap in your hands, a spin on your globe. When you've done all those things, sign up for our mailing list. You can find out where we will be appearing next, maybe even in your city. And we'll make more announcements about that soon. And until next time, as always, happy travels. Bye, everybody.